It's now my great honor to introduce our guest this evening, Deb Perlman, who is no stranger to the Free Library. I think this is her third visit. Um, she famously created um, SmittenKitchen.com, a candid... <laughs> a candid go-to blog for those who want to make and eat good food without complicated methods or expensive ingredients. In fact, many of us here, including myself, are already huge passionate fans. Adapted from her website, her best-selling The Smitten Kitchen Cookbook won the IACP Julia Child Award. Deb followed this, up, uh, this success up with Kit, uh, Smitten Kitchen Every Day, a 100 recipe guide for delicious and easy to make food. Tonight, we're here to celebrate her long-awaited follow-up cookbook, Spit and Kitchen Keepers, New Classics for Your Forever Files, which you all have in your laps. Um, tonight, Ms. Perelman will be in conversation with Dina Halick. Uh, she's the head of the Philbrook Hall here in the Parkway Central Library. She also founded the Popular Cookbook Club at the library, so if you haven't checked that out, you should. Um, we are so pleased to have them with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming Deb Perlman and Dina Halick to the stage. Hello. Hi. Welcome to Philadelphia, Deb. Thank you. <laughs> I'm happy to be back. I barely made it, but I'm glad to be back. <laughs> So I, um, you've got a great introduction. I think we should introduce the audience a little bit. How many here are brand new to Deb Perelman? There's like four. Welcome, <laughs> Welcome to the cult. <laughs> no. how, how many of you are fans of the Smitten Kitchen blog? <laughs> okay, I see one person who isn't responding at all, so the third question is for you. <laughs> How many here have just read the cookbooks? One yeah, two yeahs, okay. <laughs> right, so we have some uh, work to get everybody. I know, my editor's yeah. in the audience, we don't want to upset her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, I need you guys to show out here. Right, so we are gonna talk for about 40 minutes and then we'll open up the floor to questions from you. And uh, let's start for those, since it seems to be the blog is the big one. <laughs> when you started the blog, did you have any idea that it would become as big as it is now? Oh, God, no, no way. I, uh, I thought the blog would last like six months because I didn't actually know anything about cooking. I was just figuring things out, and I was very much a non-expert who had never worked at a restaurant and had never been to culinary school and was not also a trained writer in any way. So I fully thought it was just going to be a thing that I did for a while, and it would last about six months, and then I would go get a real job. <laughs> I still think I'm going to have to get a real job at some point. <laughs> I feel this is like three jobs in one here. It wasn't, I mean, I guess it wasn't actually my job in the beginning, but it was, it was the thing that I was putting my focus into, and I did not think it was going to last at all. Why did you start? I just like, I have a lot of opinions about cooking, guys. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed this, <laughs> but it's really hard for me to keep opinions to myself. <laughs> and I had a lot of, I just, I would try recipe, and I would be like, this is good, but it should have been like this, this recipe is bad, don't make this one. <laughs> I was looking for you. Hi. Um, I, so I had a lot of opinions about food, and I thought it was fun to share. And I thought, it's, it's interesting. I mean, how did this recipe go for somebody who made it in a small kitchen? Like, just, you know, realistically, what was it like to try to find? I still remember running around looking for Heath bars to make the chocolate toffee co cookies, and I couldn't find them anywhere. I live in New York City. Why couldn't I find toffee bars? It was crazy. But I, so I thought, I liked talking about cooking. I like talking about the way it goes in like a real kitchen and a real life and which recipes are worth it and which recipes I would want to change before I ever made them again. And there you go. That's the whole blog. <laughs> and, and how many, is it 16 years later? Yes, it's crazy because I haven't gotten any older, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the blog gets older but I stay the same. <laughs> so now that you've been doing this for so long and it has become a career, it's a career. It's a career. It's a thing I'm doing for now. So <laughs> have you started bringing in some help? Because you started out, you did all of this yourself. Yeah. Um, I do uh, def uh, define help. Like, is there somebody there every day working with me? Absolutely not. No, I'm still like kind of a, I don't know. I, I can't, what am I going to outsource the writing? Outsource the commenting? Outsource the cooking? Like, what, what are you going to outsource? It doesn't really make sense to me. What I have brought in with this book and over the last few years that's a little different is I now have a cooking assistant who comes, oh, 
I want to say once a week, but it's like some weeks. She's really busy with other work. But she started coming a few years ago about once every couple weeks. And it's really great because when she's there, well, she mostly stands there and watches me cook because I'm a control freak. But it's really, I have found, I have thoroughly enjoyed having another person in the kitchen with me who is also very efficient. So let's say there are 15 onions to chop. Like, so she'll get, she'll get through 12 of them in the time that I get through three. Because um, I'm thinking about like how we should chop the onion and then I have a lot of thoughts about onions. So she's really efficient. Um, <laughs> but so it's really good. And when she comes, we'll get through like five or six recipe tests sometimes. Like it's incredibly efficient. So I really, I'll have these heavier cooking days and I find it really useful. And it's also good when we're on the 90th test of something and I don't want to make it anymore. Um, <laughs> she's super good at getting me to push through on that. So I have that. And the only other help I've really brought in is for this book, this is the first of the three books where I've had a food stylist come in. And I know when we think of food stylists, we think of somebody with like hairspray and tweezers, but they actually cook the food. Um, so I had, they, they came in and they helped me shoot the book for two weeks. I still do the photographs, but they helped me make sure things looked nice, even when I did not really care anymore because I was tired. <laughs> <laughs> I think the last book I actually made something. I'm like, it doesn't look like yours. And you're like, oh, for that one, I actually cooked it a little different. I'm like, but the picture. <laughs> the betrayal. I feel like I know. that's a really base level betrayal. That shouldn't I, happen. I'm still bitter. I would be very mad about that. Mm. It should, your food should look like this or the recipe did not do what it's supposed to do. You should, if you followed the recipe and bought what you were supposed to buy and like chopped it and cooked it, like it should look like this. Maybe the light's a little better. Like maybe somebody fanned out the slices a little bit, but it should look, it should look like this. This is spaghetti. Follow the plate. recipe completely. Get a food stylist. <laughs> no, I, the food stylist I worked with was somebody who does it in a very natural way. He's just less easily tired by it than I am. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still doing everything out of your own kitchen at home? I'm still doing everything out of my own kitchen at home. I mean, unless there's some other kitchen I should know about that I should be using. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, I know, I think we all know from your blog, your kitchen is small. It's small, but it could be smaller. I don't feel like it's, I feel like it could be a lot worse in New York City. Like, it's not the worst. Like, it could be a little worse. It couldn't get, I don't think I've seen a lot worse. The light is very good. The light is really important to me. And I have um, this patio door there, and I just find the fresh air and the light, I would rather have that than like larger but like less lit or less ventilated. But that's really great because it means that if we're making your recipes, we know we can probably do it in our kitchen because you don't have a secret test kitchen that has like 12 stoves oh and God, a, like, a crew imagine? of assistants doing it. No, I've got a hard stop at two bowls and usually at one because <laughs> it's just I just don't want to do it. And even if you have a bigger kitchen, I don't think you really want to do it either. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're like, oh, I have a big kitchen, so what I really want to do is wash more dishes. <laughs> So are you the only person who tests your recipes or do you like give recipes to other people to test them? <laughs> so for the cookbook, because you know, I can't edit this. I can't edit this. This is, this is done. It's printed. Um, I always use an outside recipe tester. So I'll hire somebody to make maybe not every single recipe, but the ones that I'm concerned about, one, the ones that I haven't done 92 times in my kitchen or that I still have like, I just, it's a gut thing. <laughs> um, so I will make sure they go through an outside recipe tester. And this time it, I have, I've tried it a little differently each time. And this time I had a very narrow scope where I wanted a recipe tester that lived in my neighborhood or very nearby and I could get it because I felt like I, it was very key to me that I don't just hear how it went but that I could have a taste of it at some point and so I was very lucky <laughs> to find the right person um, and I mean she wasn't bringing it over every day but every few dishes she would like save me a slice or freeze it or something so I found that very helpful but I think next time I actually don't want the person to be outside my kitchen at all. <laughs> it's the control thing, right? I just, I want to see them make it and I want to try it right away. I, I want to see what's happening. It's, it's, a, it's extremely expensive to hire recipe testers. It's weird to be like, I hope they did it well. Like, even if they did, you know, it just there's so much missing that you would get if you watched the So you don't cooking. know, you just know like their notes afterwards? Exactly. Oh. Yeah. Okay. It's scary okay. and expensive. It's expensive. letting go. When you guys find out what recipe testers make, you are all going to quit your day jobs. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the blog has been going on for 16 years, and people are still coming to it fresh and finding things. They might look at a recipe from 10 years ago that they've never seen before, and it's new to them, and they'll comment on it. Do you go back and look at the comments from old posts also? All the time. I see every comment that comes in because I check comments 
by which came in, which are the newest on the site. So I will read, I don't, it doesn't matter what post you left it on, the most recent, so I just see comments as they're left. So it's, the interaction is throughout the whole site, not just I'm gonna yeah, talk about so my Yeah, so it's basically through one. the user interface, I'm able to see comments as they come in, so I can just look back at like the last few days of what, what people have commented back and respond when I can. I think it's, your blog is so great because there is that conversation. It's not just you like drop the recipe and peace out. No. It's like you're there talking with people. <laughs> well, thank you. I think that's what makes cooking fun. I love the conversation. I always used to call it with my first book like the telephone cord cooking, but like now I'm really showing my age. But you know like the kitchen telephone, I'm going to swing this mic out. Like it's going to, it's going to land on my cousin soon. Um, <laughs> that's why we put them right there. <laughs> <laughs> Did you bring your catcher's mitt? <laughs> So, um, but you know, like in the kitchen, like this is really showing my age, like the long telephone cord and like your mom was on it and she was talking to a friend about like how this went and oh, do you make it this way? I love that little bit of conversation around cooking. I think there's a lot of information there. And so when somebody asks a question, it's nice to be able to answer it. And I think what's really great about the comments on your blog is that, you know, we've all seen the things that are like, oh, I changed this, 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 and this, this, and then it didn't work out. This is a bad recipe. Oh, I love it. You can change anything you want. It does not bother me at all. I know. And, and people it's say, I changed this. No. And you're like, that's awesome. It. I bet it would work. Yeah. I mean, I think, the, I think the actual breed of commenter who's like, I changed everything, and I'm giving this a zero star review, is a more rare breed. I think most... It, I'm not king. Like, make it however it works for you. It's your kitchen. Use the ingredients you have under. If you want to ask me why it didn't work, I might say, so that ingredient swap is not the best thing for this cooking time. You know, we can try to, like, I'm always like, tell me where it hurts. Like, about the, the, like what went wrong? Okay, so was it sticky? Okay, so, you know, like. <laughs> um, but I, no, you should change recipes however you want. Who's in charge? It's your food, it's your kitchen. And then it's like a community. Other people are chiming in saying, I bet you could do this. Oh, that sounds great. Oh, so it's really great. It's like, and I know there are people on here who, who comment on your blog all the time. Because I talked with one of you earlier today. And um, well, I can't see you, but I know you're here. And it becomes a community. And it really, like, it's nice. It's nice to get online and go to a place where people aren't screaming at each other and you're all talking about stuff that you love. We try not to scream at each other. Well, no, it's very friendly. It's a very uh, nice vibe. The vibes are good. Yeah. Yeah. So when you had said, as we were coming down, that your husband basically is cooking everything out of this book. He's so. been cooking some things out of the book. <laughs> he, he's sort of in a slower time right now. So like he's just, you know, he's, he's, he works from home. So he's able to like, you know, if he's got a little bit of time in the afternoon, he can pick a recipe from the book and cook through it. So I was joking that he seems to be picking up a new recipe for his repertoire every week that I'm away. And I'm like, I might not come home. Like this is not, <laughs> not this is not an advertisement. You guys are thriving without me actually. <laughs> <laughs> Which actually brings me to something I want to ask. And, um, Completely unrelated to cooking, because I actually literally just read how you and your husband met, and I think it's the most adorable thing ever. So can you tell us that story? He, he read my blog. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, from 2003 to 2006, before there was Smitten Kitchen, there was just Smitten. And I know it sounds so crazy, but like you did not need like a social media philosophy or a point of view. You could just ramble on the internet about whatever you wanted back then, and that was fine. And so um, I was going on a lot of bad dates, and I was cooking too. So there was a little bit of food, there was a little bit of like stories about a York, and then there were some bad dates. But I met my husband like a month into it, so there were no more bad dates ever. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was the end of that. And so, yeah. He's been reading since. I guess I thought everybody knew that, and then I'm like, well, I haven't mentioned it in a while, so maybe not. Um, yeah, so he was like, an, a very early reader. So I guess he knew what he was getting into. I mean, <laughs> I think that's fair to say that he knew what he was getting into. Hmm. <laughs> and, and I did have actually somebody ask, because Smitten Kitchen is the one we all know, is there a way for people to dig around and find the old blog? I mean, I think everything's available on the internet. I don't think you're going to be awed by the writing or anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I actually, I, I think I forgot the login to the site, and then I needed to renew. This is like 12 years ago. <laughs> um, I, I only have a few. Anyway, I, I forgot the login. I was having trouble getting in, and then I think the, the um, hosting lapsed because I would have moved it over to the, anyway. So I don't know. It's somewhere floating off in the internet. <laughs> I'm sure it's not that hard to find. So uh, that's a challenge. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm sure it's wonderful, and you can read about her, her bad dates. 
or not? Yeah, not many. I mean, if I was still writing my bad dates after my husband, we have a whole other conversation to have. That's quite <laughs> awkward. <laughs> so you started out with a blog, mm -hmm. and then you kind of started up on Twitter. I, I'm not sure, how, how, what did the, it was blog, and blog. then Twitter, and then Instagram, and now you're on TikTok. Blog. What came next? Was it Facebook, and then Twitter? I don't know. Twitter likes to tell me, remind me, like, you've been on Twitter since 2008. I'm like, well, that's embarrassing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, on Twitter. So, so you started out as a blog writer. Yeah, and absolutely. And you do, do you consider yourself still a blog writer. Absolutely. I mean, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on TikTok. But I always consider these things to be, like, satellites. You know, they're just, they're just ways to reach people. I'm telling you, I'm going to throw this microphone. <laughs> um, they're just ways to reach people. If people want to be on Twitter, we'll be on Twitter. I just think, it, but it always is about drawing people back to the recipes or the book. What made you decide to start doing video? It's fun. I like doing things that are, I, <laughs> my brilliant statement. I like to do things that are fun, and I don't like to do things that are not fun. So that's my <laughs> philosophy. But <laughs> I would say that I would not be doing it if I didn't enjoy it. And so I started playing around with making video and playing around with the InShot app and just kind of messing around. And I found it fun. So now I enjoy it. <laughs> I would not be doing it otherwise. And your kids have starred in a few of them? Um, I Somehow, they, they show up for the YouTube videos. They show up here and there. But I mostly try to keep them. Well, the younger ones still like our little pets. So that's OK. But like the older one, I mean, He's 13. If you were 13 years old and your parents put a, you in a video on the internet, would you murder them? <laughs> That's not him. He's really outgoing. But I'm like, you might one day want to murder me, so I'm not going to listen to you when you say you want to be in something. So very, I really just try to limit it. So with writing, being in the online world mm. all the time, especially with what's been happening over the last few years, do you feel any pressure or any reticence about talking about anything other than being very focused on food, on cooking. Yeah, I definitely think there's a lot more, we have a lot more expectations of people that we follow that they are, we're looking for them to be politically aligned for us or that have the same values. And I think it's because we've been through some really scary things in public life and in politics and the news where you start to think maybe I don't know the people around me and maybe they don't mean what I do. Um, I don't know if I like that as an end goal even while I probably am on the, have the same viewpoints as most of my readers. I think it's, you know, it's an interesting thing that we kind of need to know that everybody is aligned with us on all things. Um, but aside from that, I don't think that it's changed tremendously. Okay. Do, do you feel any kind of like pressure to say things when things happen? Or are you like, nope, this is my lane. This is where I'm staying. I think I mostly stay in my lane. And if I want to say something, I'll say something. I won't be afraid to say something if I want to. I, do and know I won't that say something I'm uncomfortable with or that's not true because I feel pressure to because that's not doing anyone a service. I know you would just um, uh, amplified teachers well, needing, I mean, yes. Needing there's, supplies there's and stuff. things that are objectively true, yes. which is that teachers need support. That was a really, I did not know what I was stepping into when I was like, yeah, I'll just share a couple teacher wish lists. And then I got hundreds and I put them onto this spreadsheet and it was, I thoroughly enjoyed that project. I mean, this was just, I would do that in a heartbeat. So I think, thank you. oh my God, this is so easy. This is so easy. And plus everybody, everybody loves buying crowns and pencils. Like it feels <laughs> really good. It's not expensive and it makes a huge difference in classrooms. And so I think that what I'll do is next summer, I will probably start it earlier, maybe like in August. And then maybe I'll start it with like more of a spreadsheet so it's a little more organized. Um, but I think it would be really cool. Why not? I mean, five or $10 out of your pocket to like buy some crowns for a classroom. It feels great. Buy books. Yeah. It's great. And you've got you the audience. You can get matching from a lot of your jobs too. So I mean, there's just, I feel like the opportunity opportunities are really endless. And yeah, and, and you've good. got an audience of people who are willing and they just need kind of a direction to be pointed at. Absolutely. I think that's a big thing when you ask people to give money is like, is it vetted? And so there have been a lot of times over the years where someone says, hey, could you give a shout out to this charity? I'm like, I just, I don't have time to do the research on this. One of the reasons I've done a lot of stuff with World Central Kitchen is aside from they are a really amazing organization is like they have a charity navigator rating of 100. Like, they're per like, that's perfect. I mean, as far as you can sniff into their finances, it looks clean. I'm, I mean, somebody's going to probably come up to me after and tell me something I know that is worrisome. But it's really hard to find places where you just know that it's just like, you know, they're, well, they're, it shouldn't be that hard to find. There are organizations that are helping you. But it's nice when you find a place that you feel really good about. I want to tell people that's where I'm putting my money. Cool. So... One more heavy question, and then we'll go into more fun stuff okay. again. But I know that you've talked about not wanting to be pigeonholed 
like now that you have like kids, you're the mom cook or the mommy blogger or whatnot. So how do you manage to, well, push back against that and really keep your life separate? <laughs> and the importance of that. I mean, I could pretend it's a philosophy, but I actually just don't particularly enjoy child cooking. Like it's just not, it's not. I would much rather, I, let me put it this way. The kids are fed. <laughs> we make sure they eat. We listen to their preferences. We take them into mind sometimes. But I just want to throw out this idea that, like, what if you got to cook the food that you were craving if you are the cook? Like, you were craving it. And I understand that we have to modify it for taste, for audience. But I think that, you know, the fastest way to really start hating cooking is when you feel like you have to make box macaroni and cheese or chicken tenders every night and you don't want it and you're not craving it and you're sick of it. So I think as much as possible, my goal is for you to be able to make the food that you like and that you're craving and then just find ways to break it down at the family table so that the most people might be willing to try it. Also, my child who is really picky and doesn't really like anything I make. It doesn't even make, matter half the time if I'll make the right thing. Like, she still won't eat it, so <laughs> might as well just... But she loves the green spaghetti, guys. <laughs> I don't understand it either, but we make it a lot. <laughs> okay. What food trends are you a fan of? Mm. Current food trends. Oh, my God. I feel like I'm out of the loop because I've been traveling and stuff. Butterboards. Butterboards. Mm, I see. No. <laughs> no, but I did do... I did do a cream cheese board because I thought it would be fun, but then people were like, ew. But um, I just think it's fun. I don't think I'm as into the butter board because I feel like you have this thing with like the oil and the, I mean, it just works better on a plate. And also, I don't think you're going to go through all that butter. But cream cheese, like easily. So it was just a fun way to put it out. Um, I like it. I haven't tried, there's like some viral TikTok tuna sandwich, but it's in LA. So I haven't tried the copycats of that. I didn't, I wasn't into the feta pasta, but I liked, I did a version of it with chickpeas that I really enjoyed. Most of my, most of my favorite ways of swapping things are just like taking pasta or something heavy and then swapping in a bean. Um, so it's a really nice preparation. It's not that, I mean, I love pasta, but I don't necessarily like it with baked feta. I don't know. It's just not my thing. So I love doing this. Um, so on the site, there's the, basically the block of feta and the tomatoes, but you cook it with chickpeas instead and you can scoop it onto bread or you can still add it to pasta, but it's, I think it's better with chickpeas. <laughs> Are there any food trends that you really don't like? Hmm. What am I not? Or you're just like, food trends, what's that? I'm too busy. No, I feel like, I've, like they're just not at the top of my head. I will say that I deeply, passionately want to have a neighbor who makes sourdough. Like, I want to have, like, I've heard about... <laughs> My neighbors have like loud dogs that bark all the time. They do not make sourdough. They provide us with nothing. They're a great <laughs> disappointment to us. <laughs> but I heard about all these people in the pandemic who got into sourdough and people were like, oh, my neighbor's making sourdough now, so we get sourdough from them. And I'm like, my neighbors don't have anything. <laughs> so I always thought it would be cool to have a neighbor who was into sourdough. Or if I wanted to try a sourdough recipe without having to like... I don't know. I guess it's not like taking care of a child, but I feel like I have two children I have to keep alive, and having a sourdough starter might push me over the edge. <laughs> so I would love the idea of borrowing sourdough starter to try things. I would like to be sourdough adjacent, like in the neighborhood. <laughs> I, I had sourdough. I, I killed it. You killed it. I'm, me too. I'm sorry, Jill. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Pour one out for all the sourdough starters that did not make it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so now I just rely on other people's sourdough, so yeah, I understand I that. I want a neighbor who makes sourdough. Yeah. yeah. What have you, was there anything that you kind of pivoted to during the pandemic that you're like, and now I must make all the bagels or something? Hmm. You know, I would say a few of the better things that we kind of got into making ended up in the book, where we just started making French toast this one way with a baguette, and it became our go-to, and then I realized that it was a keeper. That's like it's what we've been doing almost every weekend. So the baguette French toast in there um, with the cinnamon sugar on it is... I think I'm a little biased, but it's a perfect recipe. <laughs> we make it all the time. Um, the ginger garlic chicken noodle soup was definitely something we were making a lot. And it was more about like kind of craving takeout, but like not necessarily thinking that we were going to get exactly what we wanted every time we ordered it or not wanting to order all the time. So that one and another one was, well, the chicken and rice is actually something we've been making for years, but it got a lot heavier, it went in heavier rotation over the pandemic just because... It, the leftovers are amazing. I do, I'm not like, I don't love leftovers, and the leftovers are so good that I can be like, oh my God, we have it in the fridge. I'm so excited. 
And the final one that I would say was something we made tremendously over the pandemic is the grandma, the angry grandma pizza. Um, <laughs> and it's so easy. And what I love is it makes two pizzas. So we'll totally have it like one on Monday and then the other one on Wednesday. It reheats really well. It, it's like your, um, your challah recipe. It's, it makes two. It makes Yay. two. It's just thinking ahead. Like it wants you to have challah now and the challah for later. <laughs> I got very good at your challah. Nice. So mm. I actually, somebody asked me the question, what is the difference between a challah and a babka? <laughs> Usage? Usage? Audacity? I don't... <laughs> They're very similar. I mean, when I think of like a, a challah, a babka, a... You know, I mean, this is this is the sort of the way that we make babka. Like, I think the Israeli or like bread's bakery style babka is more of a laminated dough. That's like a whole other thing. But um, babka, brioche, challah, they're all kind of on a continuum of, like, of enriched breads. It's yeasted, there's flour, there's a bit of sugar, there's either butter or oil. I would say with babka, there's more often butter, and with challah, there's more often oil. And challah is going to be a little bit probably less rich, you know, because you're usually using it like as a savory bread. Right, and a uh, babka is more like a dessert. More of a dessert, except for, unless, of course, you're making the Bialy babka. <laughs> Which you actually have a partnership on, right? <laughs> yes, um, we were just, um, they were, um, so you can order a version of the Bialy babka that's in the book through Bread's Bakery right now, and they also have it through their stores in Manhattan. Um, I think all but their... Bryant Park kiosk, which turns out to be everyone's favorite place to go to Brad's because I've gotten so many messages about it not being at the kiosk. But anyway, um, but you can order it online. They they ship it too. So basically, they're using their famous babka dough, like the laminated flaky one, with the Bialy babka filling of this, and it's going to be available for a couple months. It's so nice for a brunch. It's nice with soup, but it's really nice as like kind of a weekend brunch. I, I feel now I want to like make it and buy it I and compare. I should be bringing them. I should be, bringing, be bringing them, them. to events. They've like offered to bring food to events and I'm like, oh, we're fine. What am I, what's wrong with me? I'm sorry, <laughs> you're owed babka. <laughs> so did the pandemic change anything in the way that you worked or processed things or your routines that you've kind of kept with now that we're over? I feel like we are even more into home cooking than we were, that we have, I don't know, I feel like we would often on the weekends, we would not eat at home, we would go out because I was cooking Monday through Friday because it's my job, and so on the weekends, we go out, and I find like we're very often like, oh, why don't we make the fettuccine in here for dinner? Or maybe we've, I've become, we've become a little more homebodies, I think, like happy vegging, watching a movie, happy doing breakfast at home as often as possible, so it's nice. Speaking about your breakfast, you have castle breakfast. So we do. <laughs> how did Castle, what, what is it, how did it start, and do you actually do it every weekend? We do it almost every weekend. So Castle Breakfast is not about a castle, and it's not necessarily about the recipes. It's about a philosophy, and it was coming out of, we went to Ireland a few years ago on a summer vacation, and I loved it, and we stayed at a few castles that have been turned into hotels, and that was just, I've always loved these things, but it was at those places that I was like, I love hotel breakfast. I love like a fancy breakfast room with like the teapots and the civility. I love like the little bits of fruit out. I love like that you can kind of graze. And I wanted that to be part of our weekend at home. And so we started making, we do, I do have a recipe on the site for a kind of a whole grain, very, very rustic soda bread scone, like a brown bread, um, which is very close to what we would eat. It's basically adapted from what we would have there. But it doesn't even matter. We'll do the same thing with the French toast or with pancakes or whatever, We're including the Bialy babka. It's more about a spread of things that we put out and it's very much our weekend ritual. And the kids are, if we've been busy, they'll be like, we haven't castled in a while. <laughs> Which is exactly what I wanted. I wanted them to ask for it by name. So it's more of a philosophy of making home breakfast on the weekends different and special. Um, and I wanted like the kids to have that as a routine that they would remember. How long have you been doing it for? A few years, I would say. Yeah, probably since, probably more officially and then definitely, you know, as we were always home over the pandemic, we, were definitely, we pretty much do it almost every weekend, and maybe we miss a weekend here or there because we've got other things going on. But in general, we do it every weekend, at least one of the days. That's so cool. <laughs> so you are very fortunate that you live in New York, and you can get pretty much anything you want. Mm -hmm. Where do you get most of your ingredients? And for those of us who do not have the New York um, mm -hmm. ability to have everything at our fingertips, where would you suggest we get things? 
you can get anything you need. <laughs> um, it, it really depends. I mean, we have Whole Foods all over the place. That's probably most people's go-to. I don't actually use Whole Foods a whole lot. Just It's too... I'm not into like the big organic brand is, brands, so I don't get that much out of it. Um, and I'm not a big Trader Joe's person, even though I know Trader Joe's is really popular. So it's really just about where, what you like. Oh, we are getting, a, do you guys have Wegmans here? Yeah. Oh my God. So we, there's one opening in my neighborhood in like a matter of a, a month or two, and the excitement is, because the first one's actually in Brooklyn, which is not my neighborhood, and I'm not gonna go to Brooklyn to grocery shop. But I'm very excited we're getting our Wegmans very close to my apartment <laughs> soon. Um, but I use, um, we have little grocery stores called Westside, and I went pretty close to my apartment, and I use that a lot just for quick, need pasta, need a can of tomatoes, need some apples. I use the, I live close to the Union Square Green Market, so when stuff is in season, I'm definitely getting my apples and my cauliflower and my potatoes there. And then we also have something great in New York called, it's called Fresh Direct, and it's a grocery delivery service, but it's not Instacart. It's not like random people who maybe shouldn't be picking out broccoli for you, picking out broccoli for you. It's actually like all they do, and they've been doing this for 20 years, and I knew this because I was one of their first customers, um, is they, all they do is grocery delivery. So everything, nothing's, nothing's touched over, um, and they've got a pretty good system. Um, and I would say if you have seen any food media ever that's come out of New York, I guarantee there is a Fresh Direct grocery bag on the floor. Everybody uses it for pretty much everything. Is there anything that you love that you can't get easily? Hmm. Like I know you talked uh, about passion fruit a little while ago. No, well, yeah, we definitely, I mean, things like avocado, citrus, these things are not grown locally. These are not East Coast winter fruits, so it's really nice to be able to get them shipped when you can, um, definitely. But I mean, you can get them, but it's if you know a place in California or a friend who wants to send you avocados, you're gonna get way better ones than you'll get at the store, and for less. <laughs> <laughs> what is, actually no, I'll do this one first. Are there any ingredients that you instinctively don't use? Like when you're cooking, do you say, you know what? I'm just I don't eat shellfish. Or how long I don't do you have? I'm so picky, guys. You like I just cover it well. <laughs> I um, I don't like beets. I mean, I would eat them, but I don't know why I would have to. Like, and now you're gonna be like, oh, you just need to try this beet recipe. No, I've tried it. It's fine. Enjoy them. They're not for me. I'm not super into beets. I'm not. Um, I'm not really into salmon. I'm sorry. I know some of you have noticed. I just, it's just not my thing. I, I love shrimp, <laughs> but only certain ways. So I don't know. I, I'm, I'm actually very picky. There's probably a lot of tremendous amount of things that I don't, don't eat. I just don't get into it. Or you don't notice it because you only notice what I, you notice presence, not absence. You notice what I do cook. Very true. What's your favorite kitchen tool? Small offset spatula. <laughs> it's, uh, like, it's like you're going to starve. It's not going to help you on a desert island or anything. <laughs> I will say, I think I watched one of your first videos and went out and bought a food processor, and I'm like, I'm going to get the one that Deb has. I love it. So. I love it. But I will also say that I've been using the same food processor for, like, my entire life. And, and I own it now, and it's good. I'm very happy with it, but mine's starting to show its age, and I don't, I don't know if I'm going to be loyal forever. We'll have to see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have to address this. Sandwich gate. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, would you care to explain? So a few months ago, September, which is the very most perfect month for a nice tomato soup with grilled cheese sandwich, right? We all agree that's the perfect September food. I have a classic cream of tomato soup and grilled cheese recipe on the site. I've been making an adaptation of this one from Cook's Illustrated for 15 years, and I made a little TikTok of it because I like making videos now. And everything was fine. I guess everyone was like, yay. And then they got to this point at the end where I'm cutting the sandwiches that I've made in half. And the comments were hilarious. People were like, my soul gasped. I was enjoying it. It was like a, a record, like a needle screeching off a record. Apparently, I don't cut my grilled cheese sandwiches the correct way, and apparently there is a correct way, and I'm not doing it. And that correct way is, I know what you're thinking, what, you just cut it in half? No, apparently if grilled cheese sandwiches are not cut on the diagonal, people are like, it does not taste okay. It doesn't <laughs> taste right. And I started polling people on how they, how they cut their grilled cheese sandwiches, and the most popular response was, any way but the way you do it. Like, <laughs> I thought it was the funniest thing. I was like, I can go over this forever. 
I think you are all nuts. Because I, <laughs> on this one, I like, I will, I am against the popular opinion. The correct way to cut a sandwich is the shortest way across the sandwich. It is about having the sandwich guts not fall out. And I don't understand why we're cutting it in a way that the maximum amount of sandwich guts spill out. It just doesn't make sense to me. But then, I don't know, I think you guys got inside my head. So sometimes when I'm making soup, I'll make not grilled cheese, but like cheese toast, like kind of open face, you know, grated cheddar cheese, and then you broil it, and, get, and I find myself cutting it on the diagonal now. And my husband says I've been giving into peer pressure. <laughs> <laughs> but the shortest way across, here's the thing, here's the thing. <laughs> Because if I ask you how you cut like rye bread or like an oval bread, you'll say, oh, this way. And if I ask you how you cut a baguette, you're like, well, it's obviously this. It's very obvious. It's the shortest way across. You guys are the ones with the exception to the rule, not me. <laughs> okay. I've now made some enemies, but I, I said my piece. <laughs> but I loved the conversation. Like, I think all food debates should be this low stakes. It was so enjoyable. And people are so passionate about it because it's such a cozy comfort food. And everything's just wonderful. And you're so excited to make it. And then it's like, screech. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> OK, a few cookies before we uh, throw it over to the audience. Quickly, rose water or orange blossom water? Orange blossom water. Do you still hate cilantro? Mm -mm. No? No. In fact, the other day my husband's like, you're, you're eating cilantro. I'm like, have you been paying attention? No. I mean, my issue with cilantro was always that it, it, it's in all of my favorite foods. So yes, I've come around. Do I like cilantro alone, like a giant fistful of it? No. But I love it with garlic and ginger and Indian food and Thai food and everything. So yes, I've come around. And finally, which celebrity fan of yours makes you the most giddy? I don't you know, you know have that I have. Do I have celebrity have fans? Martha Stewart. Is anybody more famous than my mom? <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't really pay attention to that stuff that much. It's probably really. healthy. Yeah, I think it's just weird. I think, like, I mean, I definitely remember, oh, someone so made your this or that. And I'm like, that's cool. But, like, I'd much rather everybody else is happy than a few celebrities. <laughs> so I'd rather you guys be here. <laughs> Okay, and I'm going to ask this because I know your editor's in the audience. So, any plans for another book? No. <laughs> no, that's, that's a hard no. <laughs> I am, um, no, one book at a time. I love this book, actually. I'm like, actually, I know why it's like surprising, but I'm like, I really like this book, and I'm very happy with the way it came out. And I fought tooth and nail for that cover, and I won. <laughs> and um, I don't, I just, I want this to live in the world for a while, and to celebrate it and enjoy it. And then I'll let you know if I'm bored enough to write another book. But, but the know. blog is forever, right? The blog is forever. <laughs> I look forward to getting back and getting more blog recipes out the door. I want to make more videos. I just I love that schedule where I just kind of wake up and cook what I feel like and work on the recipe that I feel like working on that week. <laughs> that is the life. <laughs> Hi, big fan here. So Hi. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to know if you're going to be bringing back the weekly YouTube videos because I mm. make your broccoli slaw all the time and it was because of that video. So Thank you. Um, the answer is I would love to bring back YouTube videos. I, the problem, so TikToks, I can just make them. YouTube, I need to bring a team in to like shoot it and edit it, then it goes to an outside. It's like a whole process and I need a new team. I wasn't unhappy with them. I just, it's time for like a new crew. Um, so when, I'm, when things slow down with the book, I think I'll start getting back to finding a new person who can work in my small space and get the video out very quickly. I think it would be really fun to make more. Um, just need to find the right people. I noticed that you have in the new cookbook a recipe for portobello hoagie. And <laughs> oh hoagie is such a Philadelphia I forgot. thing. So I'm curious. What was the what was the reason for calling it a hoagie? Because I and wanted. Thanks for the shout out for Philadelphia. Ah, that's actually. <laughs> Thank you. That is one of two shout outs to Philadelphia, but both are very not done. And a I forgot about that, and I forgot I decided not to come to Philadelphia because everybody was going to yell at me for calling it a hoagie. Um, it's not a hoagie. I know it's not a hoagie. I also called it kind of like a vegetarian cheesesteak, and then I said that's not really fair to it because it makes it sound like it's like an inferior version when I actually think that it's. I'm not going to say it. I don't want <laughs> someone's going to lob a cheesesteak at my head. Um, I think that portobellos are wonderful in their own right. Um, so I don't. 
I don't know. Maybe I grew up in central Jersey. So, you know, there's like 50% fed from New York and 50% from Philly. In my heart, it felt like a hoagie. I felt that it was one. I understand it's not authentically a hoagie, but I, I felt like it was a hoagie. I, I tried sub. I'm like, that's not it. It's not a melt. It's not a grinder. It's not a, it's a hoagie to me. So I, that's what I associated it with. <laughs> <laughs> and the other Philadelphia reference is the, um, the it's not Stromboli. But there's a, there's a spinach bread in there where I kind of roll it Stromboli style um, using a pizza dough. But it's not Stromboli. I know what Stromboli is, and I know this isn't it, but there are two Philadelphia references. <laughs> I'm just curious what your process is like for picking a new recipe. Where do you start from? Do you yeah. have a streamlined process for that, or is it kind of different, and you see something you like, and then you go for it? Um, usually my process is just a craving or something that I've wanted to get right or that I can't get right. But I think what's unusual about my recipe development process is that I'll, I'll, you'll hear me say, like, I worked on that, I made that 22 times. I made that 16 times. I did not make it 16 times in a row. Like, I wasn't, I didn't just, like, start on Monday and then made it until we, we wanted to die from looking at it. <laughs> I will, <laughs> I'll work on it. I'll be like, oh, you know, I really want to make this portobello sandwich. I've had this idea for it. I'll make it once or twice. And if I'm not happy with it, I just take a lot of notes and I keep it on a document, and then I close the document. And then the next time I start craving it again, I will pick it up from where I left off. So the 17 times might be over two years, or three years, or eight years. I will work on things until, to me, it's ready to go out the door. Um, so I tend to work on things for a long time, and I tend to work on them when I'm in the mood to have them. Because I'm not just, it's not a test kitchen. Like, we'd like to be eating this for dinner. And if we're sick of looking at it, I don't want to make it. Hi, um, long time, long time fan. Um, broccoli rubble, uh, the best. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if there are other cooks, cookbook authors that inspire you and um, or that you are particularly drawn to. Um, very much. I wouldn't say there's any like like just this person, but I love when there's new cookbooks out and people are doing things differently and more fresh. And I love seeing what's out there. I love one of my favorite parts of book touring is I get to hang out in bookstores and see all the books that are new. I was at a cookbook store in DC this morning and it was just so fun seeing what was out there. I mentioned a couple of them that I was flipping through on Instagram today, but it's just, I love seeing what's new, what's different. I love hearing fresh voices. I love seeing foods that we usually didn't see published. You know, it's just, so that tends to be, I tend to be the most excited about things that I haven't seen before that are outside my knowledge base or my comfort zone or what I grew up with. That's what I get really excited about. Uh, hey, Deb. Third time seeing you here at the Free Library with my best friend. Um, she got like a punch card. Yeah. <laughs> um, we love it. Uh, so I loved, loved, loved seeing that the bodega style egg and cheese sandwich <laughs> made it into this book. That was the recipe that made me addicted to Smitten Kitchen. Did you see the way I cut it, though? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm with you on on the way that you cut sandwiches. So I just it's also just because it, it doesn't get on the sides of your mouth. It's, it's you and me against small, the world, though. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, and so I love the whole story behind it on your blog of like that when you're craving that bodega sandwich, you're just, mm -hmm. you have to have that. Is there anything that, any foods that for you, it's like, yeah, I could make it at home, but nothing is going to be getting it from this like one location or it's better as takeout? Oh, absolutely. So many things. I feel absolutely no desire to make croissants. I've made them a couple times, but... <laughs> I'm really lucky. There's some really amazing, I mean, I can pick four different places that make amazing croissants all day within a few blocks of my apartment. Like, why would I make a croissant? At best, I've followed recipes to the letter. I did everything right. They're good. They're not great. So I'm happy to buy croissants. I'm happy to buy sushi. I'm happy to buy bagels, although I, I do once in a while have fun tinkering with my bagel recipe because I think it's nice for... Um, for Yom Kippur, when you do break the fast, I think homemade bagels are such a flex. So <laughs> they're fun. So I will do it for Yom Kippur, but not otherwise. Hey, Deb, big fan. I make your blueberry uh, muffin recipe all the time. It's amazing. Yay. Um, my question is how you chose which recipe to put on the cover of the book. 
<laughs> How long do you have? <laughs> um, it is always, I would say with all three books, trying to choose the cover recipe is very, very difficult. I don't want to put meat on the cover because I think it puts people off when it's not, it's predominantly not a meat-based book. I don't want to put a baked good on the cover because it looks like a baking book. I don't want to put runny eggs on the cover because they're divisive. I mean, you, you see how narrow it gets. Soup can be boring. You know what I mean? If it's a dish that everybody knows what it is, it may, you know, like spaghetti and meatballs, it can work, but like, you know, how many cookbooks do you think have spaghetti and meatballs on the cover? And then you're also getting into the meat thing. So I find it to be very, very tricky, and we have a lot a lot of conversations with my team and my publishers about what the right, which recipes could work, which ones are aesthetically correct. For the first book, there's a recipe for tomato <laughs> shortcakes with goat cheese, and I love that one because the tomatoes are beautiful. It looks familiar, like you have, but you haven't made that before. Um, for the second book, we had a lot of like, what is that on the cover? So that was a little bit of a learning curve, but it's with potatoes. It's a potato tort with some arugula on top, which, again, a lot of people don't know what it is. So, <laughs> And for this, I was fighting for the green spaghetti the whole time, but there was some concern that the green spaghetti... Well, this is actually... I would like to pose this question. <laughs> on a cookbook cover, are you looking for a dish that it looks familiar and you know how to make it? Or are you looking for, I don't know how to make that, but I wish I did? And for that, we went back and forth a lot between... Is this too obvious what it is? Do we feel like we already know what it is? Would you buy a cookbook advertising spaghetti on the cover? You probably have all of the spaghetti recipes you need on this earth. But um, I won, and I hope you guys agree that it's worth it. I won. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so with a lot of food trends, there's also food equipment trends. Um, do you think you'll dabble into like the air fryers, the instant pots? Um, is that something you'd consider? I bought an air fryer, and I am not into it. I know everyone loves theirs, and I am happy for you, and I want you to be happy with the machines you have. I felt like it didn't really do anything that my oven at high heat does. And I also, this is my own fault. I was told to buy a bigger one. I bought the small one, so I could put, like, four chicken wings in at once. And it took really, like, a good 45 minutes to get them crisp because I felt like I had to run it twice. Anyway, I just, it wasn't for me. I did have an Instapot for a bunch of years, and then I just got rid of it. Um, but I might have been a little premature with that because I kind of missed the slow cooker function. So I think I might go back and get an old school slow cooker. Um, but again, maybe, um, I think the Instapot makes a tremendous amount of sense for a tremendous amount of people. But I work from home, so I don't really mind if something's simmering on the stove for a few hours because I'm not leaving anyway. Um, what else? I don't have a juicer, but I'm not really that into juice. Oh, weird. Who's like, I don't, I don't, I don't juice is okay. Not my thing. <laughs> Something you can buy. I just don't. I like water. I like coffee. I like wine. Who's <laughs> not into juice? That's juice. I like, oh, but, but I have, I have a citrus juicer and it brings me so much joy. So I like a regular, but I love having a citrus squeezer. I think fresh orange juice, fresh lemonade, fresh grapefruit juice is unreal. So that to me is worth it. Look, we all have our things. <laughs> I was just wondering if there's any sort of like white whale dish for you that you've been trying and trying and like just can't get right. Like millions. There are so many. And sometimes it's not like it's not coming out, but I don't feel like it's worth talking about yet. Like it doesn't feel special to me. Maybe it's either that it's working fine, but I don't think it's doing anything interesting or adding to the conversation about that dish. I'm not doing it in a way that I think is worth like cranking up the old blog machine. Like, you know, it should be for something worthwhile. There's enough recipes on the internet. So sometimes it's that, and there's some things that I'm just never, they're never quite right, and I'm working on it. So it's like a work in progress. I haven't really, I haven't made my perfect blueberry pie yet. I haven't done my perfect, I don't know, what are those like Scandinavian knots that are like cardamom buns, but I don't really want to do it anyway. So just like, it's close, but it's not it. There are a lot of recipes at like the 9 out of 10 mark that I'm still kind of waiting for an aha moment to hit me of what I want to do with it to push it to completion. Hi. We wait all year for Romanesco, but most recipes that you find out there, you know, chop it up real fine, and, and it's such an exquisite vegetable. Do you have any recipes for Romanesco? Or are you working on one? 
No, but I, I don't have, I haven't much called for it much specifically, but I feel like most of the time you're using cauliflower, you could use Romanesco instead and in most of the prep. And I'm with you, I don't really, like turning it into mulch and calling it rice feels like insulting to both rice and the cauliflower, so I don't, that's not my favorite thing to do. <laughs> Hi Deb, long time Hi. fan, I'm with my sister-in-law who's also a big, big fan Hi. of yours. Um, yeah, how do you maintain your kind of passion and fun-loving nature for all of this. I feel like, you know, with Instagram, TikTok, all this social media stuff, things can get really overwhelming, but something that's so great about you is that it does come through that you're so passionate about all this stuff, and it's probably why all of us love it. So how do you keep it fun, and when do you take a break? <laughs> <laughs> um, well... I wake up in a good mood every day of the year. I am a bright, I wake up bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and there is no member of my immediate family who can boo me. Over the, no, no, I am not. I'm not a morning person, and I'm definitely a curmudgeon about many things. But I just, I'm just not gonna. That's just not gonna be the moment that I share. If you're seeing me, it's because I want to share something, and I'm in a good mood about it. And if you're, you know, it doesn't mean I'm always in a bad mood if I'm offline. I just mean that, like, I'm just not gonna be like, well, today sucks, you know, like, because I just think there's enough of that. And I'm not saying we always have to be happy. I don't want to give an unrealistic view of things, but it's just not necessarily the energy I want to like land on and stick with. I'm mostly trying to move on. Um, but the other thing is that I actually, not actually. Perhaps unsurprisingly, think that I have the best job in the world, and I feel incredibly lucky that I get to do this. This is incredible. I thought I was going to start a blog, and it would last six months, and instead I'm here with my third cookbook, and I don't know why you guys aren't sick of me yet. I would probably be sick of me by now, but I'm really glad that you're not, and <laughs> I feel really lucky that I get to do this. So if I have lost, if I'm in a bad mood, it's because I've lost that perspective, and I need to get it back because I, in general, I just feel really lucky and grateful and happy, and I think it's so cool that I get to wake up in the morning and cook what I feel like, and that there are people who actually care about how I feel about that dish. That's amazing. Hey, um, so I go first to Smitten Kitchen whenever I need to cook anything, so <laughs> huge fan. Um, but you have 100 million recipes for pancakes, mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure we all have different favorites, but I'm wondering about, um, are there like, applications for different pancakes? Like, talk that. to me about pancakes because talk there are so many recipes. There are so many recipes for pancakes. And there is different philosophies because I know that some people like them kind of like bigger and softer and some people like them thicker and more tangy. So I think there's a pancake for everyone. I would say for most of the last many years, the tall, fluffy buttermilk ones had been my go-to. But then I did this project for All Recipes a few months ago and they asked me to make their most popular, it was for their 25th anniversary, their most popular recipe on the site is their good old-fashioned pancakes. And to me, they're like diner pancakes. They're kind of thinner, they go flat, you can like kind of stack them high and they stay, they just use milk, no fancy ingredients. And I made them a whole bunch of times while I was working on it and now I've been cheating on my pancakes. <laughs> so. I'm like, you're like, which one on the site? I'm like, well, actually, it's not on my site. Um, <laughs> no, I just, I think I just go through moods, too. I love the um, buckwheat pancakes in this book, and I think they're really fun because they're chocolate, and the buckwheat is not there to be, like, wholesome. I mean, it might also be, but it's actually there because I love the texture and the little crackle. Like, the, you get a really nice edge from that. And I feel the same way about the strawberry cornmeal griddle cakes on the site, where the cornmeal is not there to give it a cornbread texture. It gets this really nice crisp in the pan, and I love that when strawberries are in season. Okay, so yeah, I basically have no loyalty to pancakes, <laughs> and I just, it's whatever I'm in the mood for, and I think that is okay. <laughs> and that's why there's a thousand pancake recipes on your site. <laughs> I, I feel like I've been making pancakes more in the last year on the non-castle, the non-scone day than any other year. So we might be in a pancake moment right now. Hi, Deb. Thanks for being here in Philly. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm curious how you choose which recipes go on the blog and which recipes you save for a cookbook. Okay. Um, so it's not a perfect system. Sometimes, 
for a book, it's something that I imagine having even more longevity, or maybe it's more that something for the site, I feel like is very specifically of the moment, and maybe it works really well for that holiday. Like I said, there's a roast turkey on the site. There's challah stuffing on the site. There's things on the site that it's just not that interesting for me to put them in a cookbook. I want you to be able to open. It's more about what I want the cookbook to be, too. I want you to be able to like open it to any page at any time of the year. And obviously, some vegetables and fruits are more in season at some point or another. But the goal is for most of the pages to be usable most of the time, no matter what week or season you're in. And that's that rule is not the same for the blog. I feel like for the blog, I can really get more into a specific part of a season or a specific holiday or a kind of recipe I might make only one time of year. And that's OK, because I can run it then. Does that make sense? Yeah, but it's not a perfect system. There's a lot of stuff in here that would be good on the site, um, and then there's a lot of stuff on the site that would be good in a book, but it's but just you've not got how both. it happened. <laughs> yes. You don't have to choose. I don't have to choose. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming. It was Thank you. fantastic. Thank you, Deb. Thank you.